My name is Rachel Bestuda. I am the project director um, for the Tri-State Fair project. Um, the other, uh, other one I'd like to introduce is Jean King. She um, does a lot of behind the scenes work with me. She also um, will be leading our group discussion today. So that will um, have towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so just as a little background, because I see some new faces here, um, this is the, this workshop is part of the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project. So this is a project that is funded by um, the USDA and Northeast Fair, and it's a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. It's a three-year project, um, and so we kicked off the three years uh, with a needs assessment last fall to determine what uh, further training was needed and education was needed for ag service providers as well as uh, farmers who join our workshop. So people were interested to find more information out about animal nutrition and also um, animal health and well-being as well as pasture management. So what we've decided to do is structure the programs this year in such a way that uh, we focus on animal nutrition and how it relates to animal health and well-being. Um, so this is our third and final classroom session for this year, and then we're going to jump into our field training workshops um, August through October. So there is a flyer up here for anybody who's interested, as well as directions to our first workshop, which is going to be at UMass um, at the Hadley Farm next month on the 17th. So we do hope that everybody can join us. Um, each of the workshops are going to be a little bit different, but we'll cover topics that were discussed in the classroom throughout the year this year. Um, just a quick overview of what our goals are for this project. We are hoping that you guys will be able to um, get further education and training, obviously, on uh, animal nutrition and how it affects the health and well-being of an animal, um, how you can feed differently to, to enhance their uh, health and, and well-being. And then we're also hoping to be able to provide you with some strategies and some tools that you can use either when you're on the farm or when you're working with farmers. Um, and certainly feel free at any point to share your thoughts and goals um, with me or with Jean uh, so that we can make sure that we are getting um, and hitting everybody's um, hopes for attending these workshops. Does everybody have a binder? I know that some people have received them before, um, but the purpose of our binders are to be able for you guys to be able to keep all of your notes and all of your handouts from all the workshops in one central place over the next three years. So certainly organize it as you wish. Um, if for some reason you decide that's not really how you'd like to organize yourself, that's okay. Leave the binder here. We'll utilize it for somebody else on the way out. So the other thing I think is worth noting, um, we have not in the past two workshops, but we are today recording uh, the workshop. So it is going to be once edited, um, available on our website and uh, for you guys to reference. And then certainly if there's anybody else you think would be able to benefit from at least some of or all of the presentation today, you can point them uh, in that direction. All right, so I think what I'll do next is introduce our guests speakers, um, and then we'll move towards a group discussion after they've presented to kind of wrap up the day um, and get an idea of everybody's thoughts based on the concepts that we've taught um, in, in today's workshop. Okay, so Joyce is our first speaker today. She is a dairy and livestock educator at the University of Connecticut. She helps farmers, landowners, and towns make decisions by sharing university research results. Her job involves building construction, planting of crops to feed animals, animal disease prevention, animal nutrition, and the interaction between farms and their surrounding environment. So today, Joyce is going to be focusing on um, several diseases that uh, impact animal health and welfare as a direct result of their nutrition. Uh, Dr. Katherine Peterson is our second presenter. She is an associate professor at the University of Rhode Island her research is on the characterization of gastrointestinal nematoids uh, and identification and evaluation of alternative anthemetics for the control of GIN in small ruminants. She is currently investigating the antiparasitic efficacy of pelleted cranberry vine in controlling GIN in sheep and goats. 
She has also launched an online program for Fromantra certification and has worked towards a generation of estimated breeding values for parasite resistance. So Dr. Peterson today is really going to be focusing her um, presentation on um, parasite control through proper nutrition. And Dr. Maria Hoffman is our last presenter today. She is an assistant professor in sustainable animal agriculture at the University of Rhode Island as well. She, her research focuses on evaluating how poor maternal nutrition during gestation can affect the DNA methylation patterns and development of pancreas tissues of lambs. She is also working to understand how maternal programming during gestation can alter dairy calf health postnatally. She has raised sheep for over 15 years and has a flock of 40 sheep as well as cattle and feeder pigs. And today, Maria is going to be focusing her presentation on um, the importance of nutrition during gestation and its effects on the animal itself and uh, that animal's offspring. So I think we'll get started with Joyce. Uh, we'll just pull her presentation up today and we'll get moving. We're going to practice discussion groups. I work, my educational method is to have farmers get together and discuss what's going on at their farms and to learn from each other. And then my job is to sit there as quiet as I can, although that's very difficult, and then to share university research in terms of the topic of the day. And so we're trying to have local farmer discussion groups around Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and um, come up with different topics for that discussion, but we don't want the farmers to have to go very far. So you guys are goats and other, other things too than I, poultry, but um, I would like you guys to be in a goat discussion group this morning for a few minutes. And I would like Catherine Peterson to join these guys, maybe, could she sit here and be the farmer? So she's going to be the farmer that has invited you to her farm today. Now, who else has goats? Jennifer, would you like to come and join the goat discussion group? Who else has goats? And the nice thing is that you're all Massachusetts. Well, Catherine, you live in Massachusetts, right? So this is the farmer that has invited you to visit her. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Jennifer, and your name? Jana. Jana. And your name? Marianne. Marianne. Okay, now, don't look at this yet. Now, we're going to start a sheep group. Maria, would you like to be in? Kevin is the farmer. Would you like to come visit Kevin's farm? Sure. Okay, here's a nice seat for you. Who else has sheep? Would you like to come visit Kevin's farm today? And now, did anyone say the word beef cattle? I think I heard steer in the background. A dairy, but he's going to be a working steer. So, would you like to um, have, invite Kevin to your farm? He, you could go over there, Kevin. And, and um, Kevin has beef. You have beef also, right? <gasps> <laughs> he messed that up. All right. Well, we're just starting out, and he's only four months old. Now, let's see. Rachel has beef cattle. Could you join that discussion? Group. Okay, here you go. Now, you guys didn't get this yet, did you? Um, okay. Actually, he has one. I already have one. I'm sorry. He's a farmer. Thank <laughs> you. But he's going to work. He's yeah. going to be a working steer. Do you know about working steers, Kevin? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, what kind of species do you raise? Okay, sheep. 
So when we first got this here, is our sheep group. Would you like to come and visit? Kevin McCarthy is the farmer today. Okay. So, um, can you move your chair back just a little bit? No, this way. Make it bigger circle. And the chair. Here's a chair. Could she have this chair? Okay. Okay. Great. All right. And your name is Melissa. Okay. So I need to learn more about that part. And what do you mean by doing? Which species would you like to join? Oh, all the different species. Okay, come over here and join this group. Okay. Okay. And introduce yourself to the group. Pardon? Introduce yourself to them. I know, I know it's one of them. Okay. I'm going to now tell you what you're going to do. Um, on this sheet I handed you, I wait till Sylvia finishes. Um, on this sheet I handed you, let's see, we've got sheep is group three. So could you guys, group three, look at your symptoms under group three. You guys, goats, let's look under group two and look at your symptoms. And you guys are um, group one. Okay. Um, oh, I, I changed it, Kevin. I changed it to your group three now. You could you could stick to group four. Do you guys graze your sheep? Yeah, not as not as yeah, we do. All right, go ahead with group four because you already um studied group four. Okay. <laughs> so you guys are group four, you guys are group one, and you guys are group two. All right. So I want you to look at your symptoms listed. Okay. I want you to look at your symptoms, and I want you to come up with the disorder that the symptoms are describing. Okay? Now, if you can't come up with the disorder just by looking at these mysterious symptoms, then you need to ask the farmer more questions because the farmer has more information. But in this discussion group, you guys all arrive at the farm and you go, this is what is happening on my farm. Can you guys help me what this disorder might be? You might have even invited a veterinarian to join your discussion that day, and that could help as well. So um, when you come up with the disorder, I would like someone in your group to present the disorder to the rest of the group, and what was it, what symptom was the key to coming up with that? disorder, just so we don't go through all the symptoms. Okay, so I just came up with three different disorders that were very common. So go ahead and try to come up with which disorder I had in mind. Okay, I think we're done with visiting with the farmer, and we're going to just go through the disorders quickly. And um, so we've got them on the slides, and for the next few minutes, we're going to look at the different disorders, the causes, and the treatments. But um, I would like you guys to remember who was in your discussion group and invite each other to your farm and invite me to come to and some other people. And our next topic will be up to the farmers what they want to see or do. Do you want to do waters? Do you want to do structures? Do you want to talk about nutrition? So that's the concept of discussion groups. You've now met each other. You get to know each other. Sometimes I'm not even invited, and I'm really offended. But, you know, so that is what we do is we keep going from here, and I have discussion groups that meet all the time and have a lot of fun because we try to keep them all localized. So, um, we're going to start up here. Okay, so our first 
our, our group in the back of the room, group one, they talked about acidosis, which is um, a high intake of grain, digestible carbohydrates, and it can be byproducts as well. It doesn't have to be just grains and lack of roughage in the diet. Risk factors are over here. You have large quantities of gas in the rumen and you have a high content of lactic acid and a low pH. Clinical signs, reduced appetite, depression, rumen contractions slow down and might even cease. The diarrhea in the description, I said, it can be yellow, it can be gray, Death can be rapid. It also is hurting the little papillae in the rumen. And so recovery might not be 100% after acidosis. And you might not have good growth and good production after they've suffered from acidosis. I've had some problems with brewer's brains being considered um, a roughage and maybe reducing the amount of hay too much because brewer's grains is sometimes free. And so people have been feeding maybe too much brewer's grains, which is a great protein source, but not necessarily a good roughage source. And so I've done some rations with farmers to try to prevent the acidosis that they think they're experiencing. So you have this slide presentation that is going to be sent to you as a PDF. You don't have to have PowerPoint. So you'll be able to go through these. So I'm just gonna go through it quickly just so you can see what is on your slideshow that you're, you're getting. It says do not crack or grind feeds. We like to feed whole corn sometimes if you're worried about acidosis and adequate, adequate roughage intake. One of my big pushes with goats is the fact that they're very particular and I'm not sure they're really eating what you guys are telling me they're eating. I think that they might be eating the good stuff and leaving the coarser stuff there and so I'm trying to figure out what are the goats really leaving. 50% um, of the roughage you offer goats is often left behind. And a lot of times it's the coarser material because they're very good at picking up the good stuff. So we might think they have good effective fiber, but they don't. When you look at that refuse, if you actually measure the refuse, compared to what you initially gave them, you might say, oh, I'm not really feeding the effective fiber I thought I was. And even out in the pasture, I watched some goats that were just eating the leaves and leaving the stems. So that's, you can't just take a handful of the pasture and measure, send it off to the lab and say, this is good effective fiber if they left all the stems sitting out there in the pasture. Bloat. Bloat was also um, discussed by, which group? You guys, right? The, wait, who did, oh, Kevin McCarthy's farmer over there. He did bloat. They figured it out very quickly. What was the symptom that made them know it was bloat? They were kicking, the animal was kicking. Oh, the, the animal was stomping its feet. Did that help at all? No, they grilled me about what I, what I got in the supplies. Oh, and you screwed up. What'd you do wrong? I put them out to the pasture like they were on early in the morning when the, the legs are extremely flat rather than waiting until later. And you did it, all of a sudden, you didn't slowly acclimate them to the pasture, did you? <laughs> and did it have white clover or alfalfa in the pasture? Of course. We, we, went, we aren't cheap. I prefer that the plants capture the 
the nitrogen themselves or having to pay for it. And and was there any small grains involved? No. Okay. Actually, you know, the funniest thing is that in your discussion about flow, we really haven't had issues with it. We did have one U that constantly floated when we went from a high end diet to a lower end diet. And, uh, mm. And, and they say that it's individual animals, and a lot of farmers say there's something wrong with that animal because the rest of the herd was fine. And it does seem like there's a defective um, issue there. So this has the cause and the risk. The clinical signs has a very distended belly on the left side. Um, difficulty breathing because the rumen can actually press against the diaphragm and cut off air. So they can die within an hour. Um, some people have had to use a syringe to release the, the gas. You want to try to have it be clean and the side of the animal clean because the consequence can be an infection. And then treatment, um, passing a stomach tube to relieve the pressure of gas. Your, your vet might do that the first time you're watching. And you know, it's going to be the same animal over and over. So you're going to watch her. Um, Let's see, always give them dry hay before you put them out to pasture. That's one of the, and there are feed additives that you can give anti-bloat um, blocks. Yes. When you were talking about putting the thing in her mouth, you were getting her to, I guess the top one encouraged belching. It, it, it got her just chewing, so I guess she was making it. It could be saliva. It was a little bit less than the other one. Yeah. 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 Um, they say when, even when the pasture is headed, to be very careful and maybe just give them the hay. Uh, you don't have to give them a lot, but in first thing in the morning before you put them out on the pasture, if you have an animal that's tending towards bloat, especially. But if the pasture is coarse enough, you wouldn't think you would need it. But if it's high in alfalfa and white clover, you might want to. I think they get used to it after a while. And my concern would be more if, if you're, they're going from the barn to the outside on grass and pull them up with the hay before that. Um, so they don't overload on it. And then also to stop them from getting their schools. After they've been out on it for a while, it's less of an issue. But they're used to it. So the only Caveat that I have is, is like the day like today when it was almost like it would rain a lot slower. Yeah. I'm glad the goats are smarter, but I guess not. I mean, I, it just kind of thought that they would know what to eat and like how do they survive for as long as all of the thousands of years they survive. Now, so where? <laughs> <laughs> we have the one. <laughs> Kevin? One of the reasons that it seems to be, you know, as often as you can or year round, especially like in the morning, is to create a, almost a blanket in the stomach. And, that we're, all right, and it's 
called the room and mass in dairy cattle uh, that we look at mostly in those cattle. Um, but it slows down the disturbance of the high starch feed for a very, very digestible overall process that that kind of ass back and it will just slow down everything the way it's the room and and how about if and it's called frothy bloat so maybe the mat keeps the froth down because it's the frothiness and you're right over time we've probably taken the animals off of that really coarse um, rangeland that they evolved on and we're probably feeding them better stuff than they had when they were evolving. So we're going to move on to the next speaker. And I just wanted to show you a couple diseases so that you're intrigued enough to open up your file when you get home. Um, oh, I do have a handout for poisonous plants. Um, I can just, I can just, okay. And if anybody would like to sign up for a discussion group, I also have a sign up up here. And make sure you tell where you live and what your species of interest is so we can do local groups. All right. So um, I've changed my topic, my title a little bit, I think, to be more reflective of what I want to cover with you today. Um, controlling livestock parasites through proper management and optimal nutrition. Nutrition, as you can imagine, is kind of like the vein that, that runs all through proper animal management. You know, it, you, you, you can't have healthy animals without having optimal nutrition. So I'm going to be talking to you today about um, the just controlling live the, the general principles of controlling livestock parasites. Um, I am not. This is the disclaimer. I'm an animal scientist. I am not a parasitologist. Um, I work closely with Van Zajac, who is a PhD DBM parasitologist down at Virginia Tech. Um, my primary um, foray into gastrointestinal parasites was using it as a model of infection um, for sheep and goats. And so I have, I consider my levels of expertise to be sheep and goats, but as you can imagine when you're talking livestock in general, that the, the concepts and the principles of parasite control are, go across species. It's not, good management is not limited to one to sheep versus poultry. You have you have general concepts that that bridge those species. So I'm going to be talking to you about that today, and then be getting into some of the um, times in an animal's life um, when, and talk a little bit about the actual impact of nutrition at different periods of their life. So when when you're talking a parasite, you know, they're not really there's not really a parasite unless there's like the host, okay? So there's this relationship. Um, hopefully you haven't had any relationships like this in your life, but you know, you, you generally the host parasite relationship is it is truly a relationship. Um, can anybody tell me which one of these animals is parasitized? Nope. Like the one on the left. <laughs> Thank you for committing. Um, right. We, we don't really know from looking at these animals which one is parasitized. They could all be parasitized. They're likely all parasitized. Right? They're grazing. Having an infection having a parasitic infection does not necessarily equal disease. And we're going to be getting into that some more. But that is a key concept. Just because an animal has parasites, and grazing animals have parasites, 
It's just a part of nature. We're not trying to get rid of parasites in our grazing animals. We're trying to maintain balance. Okay, so just because they're infected does not mean that these animals are suffering clinical disease. <clears throat> I mean, we know that parasites can be a problem in animals. Um, we're not going to eliminate them. So when do they become a problem? I mean, like I said, we want balance. We don't want the parasites to start winning the battle. Okay, so we're looking for balance. So what are these things that can shift the balance that we're seeking? Um, so we can break this up into um, things that shift the balance relative to the parasite. <clears throat> Parasites, um, there's weather conditions that are favorable to their establishment. Um, most of the common parasites that we talk about with livestock spend time in the environment, developing to the infective stage. Um, and when you say the infective stage, that's basically referring to that period of time when that's the stage that will can infect the host. Okay. Um, most of the time, warm temperatures and high moisture are best for development. Um, but then once they're developed, cool, moist conditions are best for survival. Um, anybody know like the most pathogenic parasite, gastrointestinal parasite of sheep and goats? What's the name of it? Homonchus contortus. It's the barber pole worm. Um, the L3 stage, which is the infective stage, is characterized by that larva being enclosed in a uh, protective sheath. So it, you kind of think of it like an egg. It's like all the reserves that that parasite has are within it. It's not feeding on anything at that point in time. So when you have um, environmental temperatures that are cool and moist, that is going to lessen the amount of reserves that that parasite is going to use. If it starts getting really hot, it's going to wiggle faster. You know, so for long, for long periods of time, if it's really hot and dry, you're going to have more death of those infective parasite on pasture. So, so understanding things that affect the parasite is really important. And understanding these cycles helps explain disease patterns um, that you see. It also helps explain when control methods are effective. Um, management is extremely important in determining your, your parasite numbers. Um, a lot of times, the parasite problems are, are due to management um, problems or your management decisions that you're making um, could inadvertently create a more severe parasite problem for you with your animals. And that's why it's really important that you understand, depending upon your species, you understand what are the common parasites, what are their life cycles. Because once you understand their life cycles within the environment, it makes it so much easier to understand the effective control me methods that you need um, to institute for, for those parasites. So when we're talking like goats here, we were talking in our, our group um, this type of a situation where you have these, a lot of goats on pasture is not equivalent to this when we're talking to parasites. And which one is, are, are the animals going to be exposed to more parasites? Yeah, that one. Why not this one? Um, the density, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, the density is lower. What are they being allowed to do? Goats are being allowed to be goats, right? They're not grazers. We're talking about that. They're, they're browsers. This is what they like to do. We put our goats in with our sheep, and what do they do? They go clear the fence line. You know? That, and and that's, that's what they do. That's what they prefer to do. So you have to kind of look at situations that you put animals in and realize you're creating your own, you're creating your own mess right here. <laughs> you know? So... So, and, but these things can be fixed. Um, some of the host factors that are really important when you're talking about parasites. Um, some animals are really vulnerable to parasites. And those are your young animals in particular. Um, the immune response is very much key to 
the response to parasites. So um, many of you know that there's some breeds of sheep that are more resistant to parasites than others, correct? Um, what about within a breed? Like within the, what, what is the, the breed of sheep that people have that are parasite resistant and it started in Maine? Katahdin's. Is there differences in susceptibility of those animals within that breed? Yeah. What about like we have dorsets. Dorsets are considered highly susceptible to parasites, the breed, a highly susceptible breed. Do I see differences within the dorset? Yeah, I do. So these, the immune response is going to differ depending upon the breed, the animal's resistance, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a little bit. But when you're young, your immune response takes a little while to develop. It's a very complex response. Um, there's memory associated with, you know, a good bit of it, but it takes time to develop. So the young animals can be highly susceptible to parasites, generally are highly susceptible to parasites, and they often don't have any of the reserves that they need to um, withstand parasite effects. Um, other animals that are especially vulnerable are any other animal that has another disease or stress in its life. Um, so infectious disease, old age is a stressor. Um, other diseases, early lactation. Um, this is why a lot of like goats, milk goats or milk sheep um, that are grazed, it, it can just, it can be a really tough situation to manage relative to parasites because the act of lactation is an immune, is, is working in kind of an immune compromised state. Most of the, like the mammary infections that you get are happening during that periparturient period where you're going from gestation to lactation. So you, you have these periods in these animals' lives that make them more susceptible to parasites. Um, and Zajac has, they had an old ram that was fantastic when he was younger, but as he got older, he became more susceptible. Genetically, he was still the same, but because of his condition, because of his declining immune status, um, he became more susceptible to parasites. Um, any animal on a nutritionally deficient diet. So if you have any type, if you have a parasite problem in, in animals that are ranging from your adults um, down to your young animals, you need to make sure that these animals are getting the nutrition that they need. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in more detail. Um, animals with increased genetic susceptibility. Um, we just, we talked about that a little bit. So some have <clears throat> usually about 20 um, to 30% of the, of the animals um, are con generally highly susceptible or they are they have pretty significant infections. Um, the 2080, it's not really like a rule. It's more like, um, it's not even a guideline. It's, it's just, it's like what happens. I was trying to think of like, what word do I want to use here? But the 2080 rule is basically that 20% of your animals generally carry 80% of your parasite infections. So those 20% of your animals are the ones that are contaminating and responsible for about 80% of the eggs being deposited on your pasture. So if you do selective, targeted control, potentially deworming of those animals, you can control the majority of your parasite problem on pasture. Yeah? With those 20% actually, they wouldn't necessarily be the ones that are being affected. No, because, because um, that's the difference between resistance and resilience or susceptibility and resilience. So an animal that's resilient means that they can harbor a fairly significant infection without being clinically affected. And a resistant animal will clear the infection. And that's where you can use like fecal egg counts to see the difference between a resistant and a resilient animal. And then I'll talk to you about the FAMACHA um, anemia scoring because then that can tell you which animals are clinically affected. But it's not gonna tell you anything about their fecal egg count or if they're resilient. So you, you do have animals with increased genetic susceptibility. Um, so 
you know, when we first look at these animals, yeah, I know, you're right, you're right. It was the one on the left. <laughs> so um, when you're looking at these animals, you don't know, you know, but it could be a very different profile where here you just, you know, you have animals that are, you know, they're not harboring much of an infection and then you have one that's really loaded. Um, <clears throat> there are primary paras parasite problems and secondary. Now, so when it appears to be a parasite problem, it could be a parasite problem or it could be another problem that is also being manifested as a parasite problem. So a lot of times, and we've had this happen where the immediate cause of death on a report from a diagnostic lab like the parasites the animal had parasites okay but was that was that the reason that the animal died or was that the is that what made the, that animal really susceptible to those parasites or was there another stress in that animal's life that predisposed them to a compromised immune system which then set them up for a heavy parasite infection which then yes compromised them so it's not necessarily parasite infections just because they're there and just because the animal died does not mean that that is what the primary cause of that animal dying. You could have other management infectious or dietary issues that you don't know about. So if you have diarrhea in a calf from gastrointestinal worm, um, it could just it be too many worms in an animal with an incomplete immune system, immune response. Um, a lot of times what we say with the, with the sheep and goats is we're looking at about, before they start becoming immune competent, we're looking at about starting to become immune competent, the four to five months is when they start mounting their own immune response. Prior to that time, they're depending a lot on what they achieve maternally. Um, diarrhea in an adult cow with worms is generally unexpected, um, but it could be suppression from suppression of immunity to some other situation in that animal's life. Um, treatment with antiparasitic drugs are not, like when we talk, they're not sufficient to control the problem on either animal. You don't want to rely on your drugs to control it. You're going to rely on drugs to treat an acute case. But you don't want to make the drugs your primary go-to. You want to kind of assess the situation, why are you having this problem with parasites, um, and try to address that and we'll talk about why we don't really want to use drugs to control. Um, so we always want to consider, like, what are these things that are making things be out of kilter? What, what is causing our post-parasite um, relationship to skew towards the parasite winning and the host losing? Um, so are the parasite numbers increasing or are they decreasing? Did something make this animal more susceptible? So you just want to ask, you want to ask questions. Um, but in order to really evaluate your situation, you also need to understand how animals are infected with parasites. Um, so most of the common important parasites in livestock are eaten by the host in two forms. Um, they can be um, eaten in the form of eggs or oocysts, which would be the case with like coccidia. Um, the eggshell can make them really hard to kill. A lot of times disinfectants don't work very well and they can also last a long time in the environment. Um, the worms or larvae that hatch out of the egg, they're not as well protected as the eggs. They are protected, like I said a little bit ago, um, to some extent, so they are easier to kill, um, and they are more likely to be killed by adverse environments. <clears throat> Generally what happens is that the parasites go from one livestock host to another. Okay, so in the typical life cycle, so like with sheep and goats, like. Um, with the gastrointestinal parasites, they are defecating manure that contains the eggs. Um, those eggs develop in the manure until they reach the L3 or the infective stage, and then they leave that manure pellet and move out onto the pasture. And then they, they a lot of times they'll move with the dew up and down the blades of grass. Um, you know, so, and then they get consumed by the next grazing animal that comes along. Uh, well, depending upon the environment, it can be anywhere from like three to five days. But if it's if it's really cool, it can it can lengthen the time it takes for them to reach the L3. But if it's just perfect, you know, warm, a little humid, you know, like it has been, then they're they're happy happy.
And like for the gastrointestinal parasites, like in the spring, um, generally when you have an average daytime or an average 24-hour temperature of about 50 degrees, you're going to start to see significant um, increase in the, the gastrointestinal parasites on pasture. Um, so, I mean, if you pass through another type of, of animal on the way, like, like the tapeworm with the mites. Um, but so what I want to talk about is how do we control these parasites? Um, so there's two basic ways I want to talk. I want to talk about reducing the number of parasites in the host, and then I want to talk about reducing the parasites in the environment. Okay, we're going to talk about drugs and dewormers, alternative antiparasitics, selecting for host parasite resistance, and ensuring optimal nutrition. When we talk about the environment, we're going to talk about pasture management, sanitation, animal density, and removing animals from contaminated areas. So there's a lot of words here. These slides are going to be posted. The thing that you need to take away from this is that these are our major drug groups. We have one, two, three. Um, these groups are widely used in, in ruminants, horses, and pigs. Um, but what you need to realize is that all of these, if, if an animal is, becomes, if the parasites in, a, in an animal become resistant to one of these in the group, it's going to be resistant to all of the dewormers in this group. So we really only have three pots of dewormers that we can go to. And once, they're, once the parasites are resistant to one of these, you, you've lost the whole group. Okay, and that's important to recognize. You have all these different trade names, um, but these are the active ingredients, and then they, they get classified into those three groups. Um, we, have, we have some great drugs. The reason that the drugs are great is because they're safe and they're cheap, and they used to work really well but they don't work as well now. Um, you have to be careful to, because there are labels, you know, there's labels with actual instructions for their use. Um, but like some for poultry, there's not that many products approved for poultry. Um, and if you buy an FDA approved drug at the feed store and use it differently than described on the label, then it's considered off label. And that is supposed to be done under the supervision of a veterinarian. So we always, um, and you, and you also, it could require long withholding times for, for meat and milk if it's not one that's already set up for that particular use animal. Um, like I said, resistance to dewormers in, is increasing because we only have those three major groups. So this is, I'm, I'm listing it first, but I'm not saying that this is our most important control, but this is something that you need to have. You, you, and you want to have, you want to have viable tools. You know, and this is one of the tools in our toolkit. And, and what your, your goal is, is to protect its viability on your farm. Because farms are going to differ depending upon their, their, their parasite profile of resistance. Um, we have, my, my question is, if you have resistance to the warmers at that point in time, going forward, can you lessen it? Because <clears throat> roughly 10 years ago, we had some huge worm problems, uh, lots of animal problems. Yeah. The safeguard, the white wormers were totally worthless for us. And the ivomectins were 50 50. The only thing that proved to be effective with us was the prohibit. Mm -hmm. so we use it sparingly, but um, it's the only thing we have that works, so we want to continue to have that. We also had an issue with prohibit a couple of years ago when it was done. Yeah, that's because I guess drug dealers also like one of the compounds, and and yeah, yeah, it says drug dealers. <laughs> so so you're not like if Anne was up here talking to you, she'd say don't count on ever getting the white dewormer back if you had a problem with it before. Yeah, it's just like they've they've gone out ten or more years, and they just don't see any appreciable return to susceptibility to that dewormer. So that's why it's really important for judicious use of your dewormers that you really try to, you don't want to compromise the animal by withholding dewormer. If the animal needs dewormer, we always say deworm the animal. But whereas it used to be 
that all animals were treated like they were the most susceptible and you just treated everybody because that felt good. Um, now we say treat only those animals that need it. And because then what you're doing is when you're, when you're targeting those animals that actually need the dewormer, that means all the rest of your animals that don't need to be dewormed, those, those worms are not seeing that dewormer. So you only have a small percentage of the worms in those animals that you're treating that are actually being exposed to that dewormer. So you're maintaining, you want susceptibility in your worms and you want your resistance in your animals. When you deworm everybody, you're selecting for resistant worms, exactly. Yeah. When you said the 10 years out, are you saying on a given farm or are you saying within a given animal? In other words, once they're resistant, that animal is resistant, so you never get that back. No, no. So what I'm saying is like if you, if, so like you, you've lost the white dewormers, the benzimidazoles. Um, they're not like the parasites are resistant. The parasites on your farm are resistant to that. Now you could buy some worms from other people. A lot of people do that inadvertently. <laughs> you know, they buy new animals and then they don't and then they don't deworm them. Um, so, but you're talking about the parasites on that farm that have been on that on that farm. Not we're not talking about the animal. We're talking about the parasites and their and the parasite offspring. Yeah. Um, alternative antiparasitics, there's a bunch of herbal dewormers out there. We've done, through our, some of our SARE grants, we've done some testing. We, we can do, um, we can do like a fecal egg count reduction. So we can, if people are using like an herbal dewormer, we can take a fecal sample from the animal. They can use that herbal dewormer and then we come back in 10 to 14 days and take another fecal sample to see how well it worked. We didn't find any real consistent efficacy. So, that's not to say there aren't any alternatives, um, but and, and these are also not really controlled. And, and once you once you learn like what the antiparas, you know, it's very complex what's contained in some of these alternative dewormers. There's a lot of different compounds in them, and you don't necessarily because these are not regulated. You don't ne the the plant secondary compounds that are conferring bioactivity in some of these herbal dewormers, I'm not saying there's no efficacy to the idea that there's, there are a lot of plant secondary compounds that are antiparasitic. But I think where a lot of the problem comes in is you don't necessarily know how it was harvested, how it was stored, how it was processed, and, and none of that is regulated. <laughs> exactly. There, I mean, yeah, the, yeah, there's, that's kind of like a, a miss, uh, there, there, it's it, a chemical is a chemical. So it's, 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 you know, I think they're, they're basically saying there's not going to be anything in here that will um, confer that activity that's not already included in that plant. Um, a lot of people like to ask us about diatomaceous earth. Um, Sometimes it's used in the environment for insects. It acts as a desiccant, um, and the sharp edges can cut the insect exoskeleton. A lot of people like think it should be able to be used for internal parasites. They, but there's no good data to support it. This is data that Ann did, where they basically had animals that were treated with ivermectin frequently, ivermectin and diatomaceous earth, and then diatomaceous earth. The animals that were treated just with ivermectin are the red line, and this is looking at fecal egg counts from April to August. The ones that were treated with ivermectin and diatomaceous earth, these are the, the these animals had to get dewormed here. So like you're not seeing any um, suppression in parasites, in fact. And what you're seeing here where it starts to go up is like the natural cycle down in Virginia, where you start seeing the increase in your parasites in, in June down there. Down here, it's more like July and August up here. Body weights, the animals loved <laughs> diatomaceous earth, to so much so that they were also gaining less weight than the animals um, that were being treated with ivermectin. So they were eating it to the exclusion of um, the good stuff. Really? When we tried it, um, yeah. we tried it, it was like they were touching. Yeah, no. It, and they, they, they did. 
Um, so alternative antiparasitics that I feel like have merit, um, and there's a lot of work that's going on, um, are condensed tannin-containing forages um, that have been shown to have, in studies, have been shown to have antiparasitic effects. Um, birds for trefoil we're working with. Um, Sandpoint is being studied out west. Cerisha lespediza has been studied a lot in the south, southeast. Um, and we're also working on cranberry vine. Yeah. So I remember going to URI for one of your uh, programs with the birds for trefoil. So we have a lot in one of our pastures. Um, how do I find out what, you know, the little variety is? Um, you probably have to do DNA on it. I don't. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of volunteer just available. Um, we don't really know yet what the bioactive. I mean, they think it's condensed tannins, but we don't feel like from our work that that's the whole story. That there's other plant secondary compounds that we're getting over and above the, the condensed tannin. Um, content of these of these forages, but these forages can also, you know, when you're talking about nutrition of your animal, um, they can also like we're, we're talking, you know, legumes here, and and they can really add a good benefit nutritionally to your animals when they're included in the pastures. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to be looking for um, different ways to you know, to enrich your pastures for grazing. We've also been working with birds for trefoil hay. Um, where, like I said, we're working with cranberry vine in the process of developing a pellet. We saw some good results um, last year where we saw a reduction in fecal egg count in animals that were infected when fed cranberry vine. So then we don't really have to worry about which little variety it is one exotic. No, I'm not saying that because we don't really know yet because the condensed tannins are very complex. And so we suspect um, because there's so many different varieties, um, we did, we tested like 50 some accessions. And it's kind of like trying to look at the complexity of those condensed tannins and seeing if there is some configuration of those condensed tannins um, in their profile that confers bioactivity over other varieties. We do not feel that it's necessarily the same across all varieties. They're not all the same. So we, we're doing a lot of varietal work. So we, we've, we've tested some, um, like I said, we, we've done like 50 accessions, but we haven't been able to, because they were just like seed accessions, so we haven't been able to like do an entire pasture, but we did work with a bunch of the commercial varieties that were out there. And we were seeing um, on the bench, uh, in the lab, pretty much equal performance on all of those, and they tend to have less condensed tannin than some of the higher tannin varieties from our more obscure seeds and old historic varieties. So the, the, the spectral profile of, the, of the, all the different varieties is, is ongoing. Um, we need more money to do more work with, with that area, but we are seeing we are seeing wide differences when we just look at plant. When we just soak um, the, the, the birds foot trefoil, um, ground birds foot trefoil, and then incubate eggs or larvae with it, we get a wide range of activity across all the different varieties. So they're not created equal, but it's going to be a beneficial thing to have in your pasture just nutritionally. Because you know they have good protein, they're non bloating, um, etc. Um, so really good questions. Um, so selecting for host parasite resistance, we want to. This is one of the things that we're doing in our current SARE grant, and we have a lot of material up here, um, and I can answer any questions on it for you. Um, one of the things that we didn't find that people did is select for animals that are parasite resistant. Um, so. It's being focused on um, in small ruminants, um, but it could be done in any animal species. We're really encouraging producers that have, you know, that are producing breeding, that have breeding stock that are producing animals for sale that are going to be grazed to consider enrolling in the National Sheep Improvement Program so that you can start generating estimated breeding values and have 
a more targeted way to um, increase parasite resistance in your animals. Um, and again, you know, an animal with um, an EB that you generate, that this animal right here would not have an estimated breeding value for parasite resistance, that would be very good because it's based off of the fecal egg counts and a lot of um, statistical modeling. But you can't see that. And you can't, you know, and and the and breeding and the um, heritability um, of parasite resistance is pretty much on on par with a lot of the other performance traits that producers want to select for. Um, the other thing that you can do, if, even if you don't want to generate, you know, enroll in NSIP, is you can you can identify those animals that are clinically affected by parasites. This is not going to tell you, this is the FAMACHA um, anemia um, scoring, and, and you basically have an eye color chart with five categories. One and two are considered normal. Three depends upon the stage of the animal, like if it's a young animal um, or an adult animal, you treat them differently at this point, because this is used as a guide to those animals that you need to deworm. So generally we say don't deworm these guys. If an animal scoring three, if it's a young animal, deworm it. Always deworm fours and fives, no matter whether they're adults or young. So it's basically a guide that you can use to see those animals that are actually clinically infected. Remember I said infection does not equal disease? This is kind of a disease indicator, that this animal is becoming anemic, and it, and it can kill them. Um, and it's really handy. It'll work in camelids and sheep and goats. Um, this is how anemic they can get. Like they have packed cell volume, so that's their, their red blood cells. They have red blood cells generally greater than 28% of their blood volume. And when they are five, they have less than 10% um, blood volume of, of red cells. So they really, it's a, it's a really good indicator um, a system that was developed in, in South Africa. And we now have an online FAMICHA certification program that if you can't get to a face-to-face -face workshop, because they're still out there as well, you can do the online system. And we have information up front here. So uh, getting to, you know, the, the theme of this was, you know, the effect of nutrition on parasites. And like I said, it's interwoven at every stage. Um, good nutrition is critical um, for effective immunity um, to develop. Um, the general rule of thumb now, this is more because the work has been done in, in small ruminants, is increasing, consider increasing protein levels in young animals and lactating animals. Um, they, they find that the immune response, you can, it'll develop faster. There aren't any really hard and fast rules that they have established yet for it, but 18% protein um, is mentioned. But the benefit really depends upon the circumstances. You want to feed, you want to at least make sure you're feeding to the NRC guidelines. Okay, but the effect with protein seems to be above and beyond a little bit on what the NRC would actually recommend for those animals you know, that there might be an added effect, but they really haven't teased that out yet. Um, you also need adequate minerals and vitamins. Um, we did some work with vitamin E, and we were looking at the old NRC versus the new NRC, so this would be equivalent to the old NRC. These were, these were the worms that came out of our animals um, when they were treated with the old NRC versus the new NRC, and we saw a significant decrease in the number of actual worms that set up shop in those animals. Um, vitamin E, um, you know, particularly, I mean, in grazing animals, I think it's not an issue, right? You got plenty of vitamin E in your fresh pastures. But when you're talking animals that are fed hay um, and, and there hasn't been widespread adoption of the new NRC guidelines for vitamin E, that that might be something you might want to look at because um, if you look at the NRC with with relative to to vitamin E, there's a lot of reasons because of improved immune function. Um, actually, they see better shelf life for your your product, um, and also we're, we're seeing increased um, 
resistance to, to the parasites. So it's like 10 I use per kilo. So it's a lot. It's, it, it more than doubled the, the old. But, and, and the other thing when you're talking about nutrition, if you're talking about heavily parasitized animals, so if you have an animal with a phomogen score of four or five, we would always recommend you pull them out of that situation. Pull them off any infective pasture, bring them in, um, give them, feed them well. Feed them some grain, feed them good quality hay because they have to replenish their blood. And it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes weeks for them to kind of come back for that. But if you leave them, you can just pull them. You can pull them inside. You can pull them into a dry lot that has no grass because any type of grass can can collect parasites. Another reason for pulling your hair with heavily parasitized, heavily parasitized animals is because they have to replenish their blood. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we say deworm. You deworm. You pull them in. You deworm them. Otherwise, they're going to, if they're really heavily parasitized and becoming anemic, they're going to, they, they could kill over on you. So you want to deworm them. If you have, when you consider to have an efficacious dewormer, they expect it to be a 95% or better clearance. Yeah. No grass, no grass. Like a dirt lot's fine. Yeah. No, no. It, that any type of grass in a dry lot. Um, I mean, there's not truly that can become infective. And that's, and that's one of the management problems we're going to talk about here in a second. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move into reducing parasites in the environment, sanitation, removing or managing manure. I mean, obviously, it's just if you can get it out of there, it's best control ever. Um, I don't really see many people going out and doing this unless they only have a few goats, right? Because it's hard to pick up. Um, spreading manure. You could just be spreading it around for animals. That's why it's, it's very important that you understand how long they take to come out of the pellet, where they become infective, and how you expose those animals. And we'll talk about um, pasture um, suggestions here in a second. Um, but the bottom line is if you're going to spread it out, you might want to leave it for a period of time. Um, and there's other strategies for putting other types of animals on it that can help. So when we're talking pasture management, this is just showing you a, a picture of some of the different rotations that you can do. We really recommend moving paddocks through in a rotation. Um, the parasites will die over time, depending upon the environment. Um, we recommend, um, you know, the length of rest is really critical. Some parasites might die in a few months. Others take years. Um, so the parasite infections transmitted by the larva will die sooner than those transmitted by the eggs because the larvae die quicker. So generally we say for the gastrointestinal parasites, you know, 60 days. Um, but I mean, a lot of times people don't, you, you just have to look at your situation and see what you can do. Um, you don't want to graze the pasture down to the ground. Um, the longer forage, they, they, the thought is that the larvae don't migrate up more than three or four inches, two to three inches. So they do move with the dew. They do move with the dew. Um, so, um, so pasture management and and um, is can be really key. The other thing that's really cool is that um, the 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 parasites for the most part are species specific. So if you do some mixed grazing, so you can either have them out there at the same time or you can rotate them to optimize your forage. Um, so sheep, goats, and camelids share parasites. But if you graze them with cattle, the cattle or the horses or the pigs can, well, the pigs will just destroy the whole pasture, but um, the, the cattle and the horses will kind of clean up. There'll be a vacuum cleaner for those parasites, and those parasites won't impact them. Okay, so, but this is where nutritionally, it, it's, it's not necessarily ideal for forage management, 
when you're rotating for parasite management. So you have to figure out a way to make it work for you. Um, but each host is a vacuum cleaner for the parasite larva of others. Um, and But you can rotate your species, mingle them together, um, do whatever you want there. So that's a really key tool that also has nutritional. And this is where we're talking about reducing stocking density. Um, you can, animals like to congregate. A lot of times they'll come in, you know, and it's called like the barnyard effect, where these areas where we were, um, Ann and I, it was, it was a short straw we had, we were dealt, but we had to go to Martha's Vineyard for a workshop. And um, we were visiting one of the farms out there, and this is just their area, and this is, this whole area here is right outside their main barn. So they had a bunch of animals here and spotty grass. And so the animals were pooping and grazing. And really, this is like the perfect barnyard that you don't want to see, right? Because you would rather have a loafing area where there's no grass for transmission of parasites. Um, so you want to try to avoid that barn. Yeah. Uh huh. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and haying is perfect because it really cleans them off of that pasture versus just cutting it would give the, the larva like a, a canopy. To, to, to hide under, but hanging it is perfect. Um, a lot of times people, they want to keep their babies close to the house. They want to keep them in that barnyard. And so they, just for the safety of those animals, they keep them in an area that could have quite high transmission. So babies get the best is generally the rule of thumb where they should go, the ones that are the most vulnerable should go where there's the fewest larvae. So in an ideal condition, I mean, the, the, so they're, they're probably being reinfected. I mean, down in West Virginia, they have an organic sheep flock, and they found that um, a rotation of four days where the animals are removed from that area every four days, um, they can control the parasites. But when they went to like five or six days, they were having trouble with parasites because, you know, even though the animals might tend to be in the area that is longer, they're still going to be, yeah, yeah. So that's, so kind of, it's kind of an intensive rotation schedule or really low stocking density can also achieve the same that, that they'll kind of, you know, if you don't have a real high stocking density, you're not going to have the infectivity. And then paying attention to the animals that you have and, and, and who are those animals that are really contaminating your pastures? You know, and you can, you can determine that through fecal egg counts. You know, because you can, you can improve the flock profile that will only help your management situation and the decisions that you have to make. Exactly. So resilience. Yep. Yeah, and and but they're the ones that are contaminating everything. Well, they they may be resilient, or they may be resistant. They're not sure. Mm -hmm. Nope. They just do. Okay. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, they do fine. I don't know how the resilient ones do fine. I, I I don't understand that. Like, how do they do that? But they do, and it's that's why when you're really trying to improve your flock profile, it's it's a good idea to use both barometer scoring supported with fecal egg counts because you can pick those animals that you wouldn't get with the farm. Pharm scoring is going to tell you which are clinically affected. You're going to want to get rid of them. So the low tech approach, we generally are keeping replacement. We go through and weigh the animal a couple times during the year. Mm -hmm. and we generally keep, we eliminate any singles because they're getting much better than everyone else. So we only keep twins and triplets. And we keep the heaviest animals after we eliminate any bad traits like bad 
mothering area. We just started with the heaviest animals and work our way down from one to the keeping. We figured that, you know, they do, their mothers either produce a lot of milk, they do well on the grass, you know, they basically work well with them. You'd, you'd probably be a really good candidate, and you have enough animals for NSIP because then you can actually, because so much of like, um, well, we so much can be have determined have by environment. Yeah, so much is determined by environment as far as the availability of feeds for in, in the environment, you know, and you want to tease out those genetic factors, and that's where NSIP, you'd make quicker progress on those, and I can talk to you afterwards if, if you'd like, because you'd probably be a really good candidate because you have plenty of animals, and, you know, it sounds like you're you're trying to select for production traits that, that you're interested in, and parasite resistance just makes grazing these, you know, these small ruminants much more economically feasible. Um, so babies get the best, um, the least vulnerable animals. So even animals that, um, I mean, I know a lot of times people are going to move the moms from the babies, but the moms, like once they're dry, they're cleaning the pasture too of larvae. So you just kind of have to understand where your animals are in that spectrum of being vulnerable and whether they're going to be actually decontaminating your pastures or suffering the effects of a contaminated pasture. So recap, um, there's no silver bullet. Um, good management is critical. Optimal nutritional nutrition is essential. You know, following those NRC guidelines, making sure your animals have what they need, but recognizing that there are some of the nutrients that given um, in a little bit of excess, could have beneficial effects, but also understanding how you nutritionally manage those animals that are really susceptible. We want to be humane. I would not recommend keeping them, you know, but be humane for that period of time. Try to get them to recover, um, you know, because, but we always recommend the deworming. But these general principles apply across species. Um, and understanding all these principles, I think, is, is really key to control. All right, so I am talking about the role of maternal programming uh, during pregnancy and livestock production. So a little background about me. Um, I got my master's and PhD, and as well as completed a postdoc at the University of Connecticut, and then I was hired on at the University of Rhode Island um, as an assistant professor in sustainable animal production. Um, so my research models, I used sheep to look at changes within the pancreas. Um, I love the pancreas. I think it's like the coolest organ in the body, um, as well as I do work with uh, molecular genetics aspects, such as DNA methylation with that. And I also am evaluating maternal programming and its effects on calf health, as well as um, something I never thought I would be involved in, which is, has anyone ever heard of the New England cottontail? Yeah. Yes. So the little rabbits that are getting drowned out by the eastern cottontail, which is an invasive species. Um, so I'm actually doing some work with Roger Williams Park Zoo in trying to help them better understand why they're having such high kit losses within their breeding program and seeing if maybe maternal programming is in effect there. So that's kind of a different caveat, but it's actually something really cool. Um, so And of course, I've raised sheep. Um, I have a flock of sheep, um, mixed breeds, as well as some purebreds. So there's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I've included this picture of this adorable little smiling lamb. Um, but sometimes when they're born as well as later in life, what they're exposed to in utero can actually predispose them to issues that they may have that may affect their productivity. Um, so with sustainable livestock production, um, I like to splash this up here. This is a diagram from UC Davis. Um, and it kind of shows how it has to all integrate. So what exactly is bringing together sustainable livestock production? And that it has to be economically profitable uh, for the farmer. It has to take into account the health of the environment. And we also need to have social and economic equality. So taking into account what the needs and the wants of the people that are actually buying our product, which is something that that group has definitely become with that advent of social media, a uh, much more vocal um, and present group. Uh, um, sometimes where they're getting their sources of information may or may not be the best. 
Um, and that's something else that we also have to be cognitive about. Um, of course, my animations are out of whack. But so basically, in order to be sustainable, we need to have animals to have a high production efficiency. So they have to grow quickly, they have to utilize feed efficiency, and they have to yield a high quality carcass. And that's so that they can fit into this group uh, aspect of sustainability. Because obviously, if you had an animal that's growing slowly and taking lots of feed to get where you need it to be, that's not profitable for you. It's not good for the environment because chances are you're going to have to keep more animals to get to the point that you need to be, and they may not be yielding an ideal carcass that the consumer necessarily wants. Um, and there's many different aspects that we as animal scientists and producers are concerned with, which is animal health, animal nutrition, as well as the animal reproduction. And all of these can impact the sustainability um, of an operation. And what I'm interested in within my research is that aspect of maternal programming. So it's kind of a sexy buzzword. You hear it thrown around a lot now because it's gaining a lot of media attention. Um, so the question is, what exactly is maternal programming? Like, how do we define this? So basically what it is is changes to the intrauterine or maternal environment during gestation that impact the embryonic and fetal growth. Um, and these can actually affect the organ function, the tissue development, as well as metabolism of that developing embryo or fetus during that time that they are actually within the womb. Um, and it has also been found to have long-lasting negative effects. So these effects, this is where the programming comes in. So these offspring are actually programmed for uh, these issues later in life, which can affect their productivity, their fecundity, um, so they don't breed as well. Um, and can ultimately impact sustainability. Um, and there are multiple causes of maternal programming. Um, there's so many different factors that can have this effect. It actually can be mind-boggling because they kind of do sometimes intermesh and intertwine with each other. So uh, one example I love to include here is an example of uterine capacity. So you have this you who looks is so exhausted. Um, it's not even funny. But she has a set of quads. Um, so if you think about her uterine capacity during pregnancy, um, when she was pregnant with those quads versus if she only had one or two lambs, um, obviously it's going to be drastically reduced. So there is potential for some or all of those lambs to have experienced the effects of reduced uterine capacity, and that can have a programming effect on them, um, which potentially can be negative. Uh, stress can also have a maternal programming effect, as well as disease. Uh, this is an example from humans, so the Zika virus. This is a very drastic physical manifestation of a disease um, uh, on that of the offspring. So they have that, um, the small heads, as well as other uh, deficits as a result of the exposure to the Zika virus. And as many of you may know from you know, being producers or working with animals, you have that animal that she gets sick, at some point during her pregnancy, and then she gives birth, and it's this kind of scrappy, you know, looking lamb or calf that doesn't do as well, um, and that can sometimes be because she was ill during that pregnancy. Um, and one of the aspects that I'm interested in within my research, um, and it's also applicable to humans as well, is the effects of maternal nutrition um, during gestation. So if we think about this from a human perspective, or sorry, a livestock perspective, um, there are many different causes of poor maternal nutrition that can be from macronutrients, so um, fats, carbs, um, as well as proteins. And you can also have micronutrient availability, so those, you know, selenium or vitamin E or different aspects of those different vitamins and minerals in the diet can have a maternal programming effect. Um, so for undernutrition, this happens very frequently in livestock, um, especially in pasture-based systems. Um, they see this a lot out in, Midwest, in the Midwest um, because the, of poor forage quality or low forage availability. So, and I always splash this up. Now, this is usually from taken from for, pastures that are out west. Um, we don't tend to get a lot of this sort of diagrams and research focused on the Northeast particularly. They really harp on it within the Midwestern states because they're larger, they have larger animal numbers. Um, but you can see, you know, and as it, as it does here, it's a little bit different because our growth season's a little bit shorter. Um, but usually 
by mid-August and especially September, you know, as we go into the fall, the forage quality availability is going to decrease. Um, and that usually coincides with when we are breeding these animals or when they are in early pregnancy. So it's not uncommon out in the rangeland out west for these animals to be exposed to about 50% of the NRC requirement for you that is pregnant. Um, so they are very uh, nutrient deficient while, during their pregnancy when they're out foraging. Um, so this is a problem that they commonly deal with. Um, in the Northeast, um, especially within, you know, interfacing with some of the producers that I've um, worked with over and talked with over the years is overnutrition is especially a concern, especially in the smaller flocks. You're dealing with, you know, some of the younger 4-H flocks um, or like um, hobby flocks, which we have a lot of in the Northeast. Um, there's a tendency for overfeeding. So that can be because, because of increased forage quality and availability. We do a lot of concentrate feeding here in the Northeast, which is something that they do not do out West. Um, and then we kind of do it on purpose in sheep um, for a period of time. So you're supposed to do two weeks before you throw the ram in up to four weeks um, after you're supposed to increase the feed uh, for the ewe in order to encourage her to super ovulate and that's called flushing. Um, sometimes it may go beyond that window depending on how well your ram is doing in the breeding season. Um, and that can expose them to greater periods of overnutrition. Um, so obviously there's a lot of concern and interest in this and potential for it to occur within uh, the industry, whether it be sheep, cattle, um, as well as other you know, ruminant species um, and non-ruminant species as well. Um, so one of the uh, founding fathers was uh, Dr. Barker, who started to kind of manifest this idea that the maternal environment could actually impact the growth and development of the offspring. Um, has anyone ever heard of the Dutch hunger winter? So this was in World War II um, when basically these people were not able to access uh, food because of the war that was going on. And there were women that were pregnant in this region. And what they, uh, Dr. Barker was evaluating was he found that men who were born to women that were pregnant during this span of time uh, were actually dying from heart disease at a drastically greater rate uh, than those individuals who were not uh, born uh, during that period of that famine. Um, and from those data, as well as some other epidemiological data, uh, he developed the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. And basically what this is, is you have this maternal malnutrition, uh, which results in um, fetal or infant malnutrition, um, and this can result in global changes throughout the individual. Um, so you get changes in growth and metabolism, and it can affect all the different organs, such as the kidney, the pancreas, the muscle, the liver, the adipose tissue. And basically what this can break down into is metabolic syndrome, heart disease. Um, usually what you'll see is the body tries to, um, in nutrient restriction, it's trying to save that fetus. And so what it actually does is it partitions the nutrients to the vital organs. So the brain, the liver, and the heart get priority over everything else. Um, so what will happen is often their head circumference will be larger, um, the brains are larger, the heart is larger, the liver is larger, um, at the expense of skeletal muscle. So you'll usually see the legs of these animals um, people included are much smaller. So if you start thinking about that from a muscularity perspective and a production perspective, that can be um, very problematic. Um, Overnutrition is something that is especially of interest within people. Um, and that is basically a difference in the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, whereas with undernutrition, what that, the development process of the fetus is trying to do is it's trying to be like, okay, fetus, get ready. It's going to be a rough ride when you get out there. So it's trying to prepare the body for a very lean environment. Whereas overnutrition, it's like, oh, there's abundance. We got to store this away. This is how we cope with this. So it's basically the body's way of trying to prepare that fetus for the world outside. Um, one of the great things about sheep, you'll hear that we use them a lot, um, 
with maternal programming research is they're small, easy to manhandle most of the time, um, which makes them um, ideal for research settings. Um, they can represent some of the other ruminants which have longer gestation periods such as cattle. Um, and the other great thing is they're very similar in their gestation, the uh, fetus to uterine ratio, as well as um, the offspring are born precocial. So that means their eyes are open, they're alert, they're able to walk around. Unlike mice, which are born naked and blind and deaf, and actually some of the development that occurs during the first two weeks of life um, in a mouse is actually what's occurring in utero in humans and sheep and other mammalian species. So that's why there's a lot of cross reaction or cross um, research that's being done in sheep that can be actually applied to people. So that's one of the cool things is animal science research is actually being used to help people as well. So just to, now that I've kind of gone over like basics of maternal programming and why we're interested in it, um, I like to splash this up. So this is um, some work done by, or it's from a review article from Do It All. Um, and basically what it does is it outlines what's going on uh, during gestation as well as during that postnatal period. And as you can see, pretty much in both pigs and cattle, um, you're going to have fat development that's occurring during that mid-gestation um, prior to birth. Um, you have the formation of the adipocytes, which are basically fat cells. Um, same thing with cattle as well. Um, so, and you also have that, that muscle formation that's going to be occurring during this gestation period. So as you can imagine, if something goes wrong with the development, whether it be stress or disease or nutrient partitioning to the fetus, um, there's a lot of potential for the adipose tissue development as well as the muscular, muscular development to suffer um, because these are very critical windows um, when the actual basis of the cells that are going to make up your meat, so your fat, which is going to help give me, uh, the meat the flavor, as well as the muscle fibers and cells which compose meat um, could potentially be affected. And that's what's really going to impact the productivity of these animals. Um, and I included this one, which is from an earlier review of uh, dues, um, where it kind of goes through, it, I know it's got like all these myogenesis words and everything like that. Myogenesis is a fancy word for muscle development. It happens in stages during gestation. And you can see there's primary, secondary, um, muscle myogenesis as muscle fiber hypertrophy, which just basically means the muscle fibers are getting bigger. So if you have any sort of insult, especially with regards to nutrition, at any of these stages um, during myogenesis or mid to late gestation where you're having a dipogenesis, um, there is potential to affect the productivity of the animal. Um, what is kind of cool and kind of scary at the same time, I don't know if anyone knows this, but with muscle fibers, um, the number of muscle fibers that you have is fixed at birth. So you only, there will be no net increase of muscle fibers within your tissue after that period of gestation because it all happens during pregnancy. So now there can be incorporation of precursor cells because of injury. Um, so there's, you know, some mechanisms, but it's, only your muscle fibers are only going to increase in size. They don't increase in number. So that's why it's so critical that we try to make sure that you have optimal nutrition in that optimal environment during pregnancy because it is going to affect the productivity of these animals long term. So I like to include this, um, this study, and again, not going to go into like the nitty gritty stuff. I just like to splash it up because it shows muscle, which is neat. Um, and this is in some fetal animals. So this is actually some ewes um, that were fed an obesogenic diet. So this study, they, what they do is um, they take these sheep who are probably very happy and thrilled with this, um, and they feed them 160% of the NRC requirement for you that's pregnant, 60 days prior to even breeding her. So she gets fat, 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 and they maintain her on that diet throughout her entire pregnancy, and then they'll um, evaluate the muscle tissue development in the fetuses. And what they found is that um, when they look at the 
development of the muscle tissue, they actually have um, smaller muscle fibers, which you can see here with the arrows. It's much, it is smaller. Um, and the space between the muscle fibers, there's a lot more of it. And basically what that's showing, it, and you guys probably can see this, it looks like, you know, if you look at meat and you have the marbling within the meat, how there's increased, it basically looks like there's going to be more space for fat and more space for connective tissue. And that's what they've been finding is that this space throughout gestation and through the lifetime of the animal gets filled up with fat and connective tissue. So you actually get more wasty um, animals because they actually, some, that's good, tastes great, but they actually create too much when their mothers are fed an obesogenic diet. And so you get very fatty meat, high connective tissue content. Um, when your muscle fibers are smaller, that can make your meat chewier. So all the way around, it can cause negative effects. Um, on that. And then there's also a lot of work that's been done with body weights, you know, because that's um, really the hallmark of how we can measure how these animals are growing. Um, and this was a study that we did when I, as part of my PhD work. Um, we had, we'd done three studies. Um, the third one was headache inducing, just because the sheer number of animals that we had and the time points and we brought animals in and out from the Midwest, so very different. <laughs> they had never been in a barn before. And what we do with our ewes for all these studies, we individually house them. Um, we get our diet from Central Connecticut Co-op, Kevin Wall and Hope has designed it. And we feed them a pellet of feed. So some of these ewes had never eaten grain before. I don't think ever. So we had to train them before we even put them on study to eat grain. And then the other problem we had was um, they'd never heard rain on a tin roof before. So when it would rain, they would freak out and break their pens and it was, it was delightful. Um, this study, we actually used the Yukon flock and what we did was we either fed the ewes, we uh, individually housed them and we fed the ewes from day 116, so this is a late gestation model. And we either fed them 160 or 100% uh, 140% of the NRC requirements. So we would either control, restrict, or overfeed them. And what you can see here, this line with the circles um, is the line for the um, lambs that were born to the restricted fed ewes. And we reared them out until they were three months of age. Um, we pulled them off mom at 24 hours to ensure, and bottle fed everyone, to ensure that everybody got the same nutrition because obviously mom's milk production can be affected by her diet during pregnancy. It took so many undergrads and so many grad students. <laughs> um, but we reared them out and what you can see overall is that these lambs from the restricted fed use, um, they weighed less for the duration of the entire study. Um, and they were not, um, and that's just something even from birth all the way through. Um, and what we, which was very, interesting, but we also expected that to happen. And what we also found too, is you can see between seven and 11 weeks period of time, these overfeds actually dipped. And at that period, actually there was a significant difference in the body weight. So they even experienced a difference in the, uh, their ability to grow and, um, as well, like the restricted, even though overall, when you look at the whole thing, um, there's no difference, but, but they do experience some aberrant growth. Um, this was a different study. This was the second study we did, and we actually started the nutrient restriction and overfeeding earlier, day 30 of gestation. Um, and we actually found that the overfeds weighed more overall, or tended to. And you may be thinking, well, wait, heavier, that's better, right? Not necessarily. Um, and especially when we looked at their muscle tissue, you'll see that this isn't necessarily a good thing, which I have the data from that. So in that first study, um, we looked at, in all the studies, we looked at carcass characteristics. So your, your loin eye area, your back fat thickness, when we slaughtered these lambs at uh, three months of age. Um, and what we found is in the restricted lambs, um, or the lambs born to those restricted fed use, even though they're maintained on a controlled diet, their back fat thickness was much um, smaller than that 
of the use, the lambs that were born to control fed use. So what this told us was that these lambs are not thriving as well. They're not really able to create the adipose tissue. And if you go back in your mind and think about um, the diagrams I showed in the beginning, it's because that during gestation, those adipocytes, that development of the uh, cells that will be used to create adipose tissue is affected. So again, I'm just including these data so that just to show and drive home the point of how the carcass quality of these animals um, can be affected. Yes. Was the liver number consistent? We try to be as we try. Um, so in this study, the, we did have some uh, twins and triplets. Um, it wasn't as evenly distributed as we would like to see, but we tried to account for it as much as we could within our analyses. Um, so this was actually the first study that we did. Um, and then we became, we were able to control it a little bit more um, and balance it across, especially um, Dr. Rachel Gately. Um, she was doing our ultrasounding for us uh, during the second and, especially during the third study. And we were, she was getting really good at counting as early as like 28 days. She could tell us if we were having like twins or triplets or singletons, um, which was great. Yeah. And we weren't, every time I went up to the field, it didn't look like we were doing anything. So, you know, that has been my habit in Rams, of course. So we had her pump through, and I think anything above 28 days, she was pretty yeah. good because we actually took all the use after they were short and marked them with how many mm -hmm. that we're going to have. <laughs> yeah. She's, and she actually worked on a study, um, the data from that, and I think they. She's pretty quick. She did 45 years. Yes, because what would happen is for this, for the study that we used her to do the ultrasounding on, we had 78 at the start, and she would come almost like every week and ultrasound everybody just to see like if they had reabsorbed a fetus, if they were reabsorbing. She got so good she could even sex them towards the um, end of it because she could identify all the different structures. So she's been able to tell like if you're having a U or a ram lamb, which is pretty cool. Um, so, and we kind of were able to use that information as well. So, it's come a long way. If you guys are looking for someone to ultrasound, she's really good at it. <laughs> no, we didn't, surprisingly. Um, in all the studies we've done, we've, I think we've only had one instance of ketosis, and it wasn't, I think it was in their control, of course. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's another thing that, you know, when you overfeed, there's a big risk with that. And then that affects the lambs, too. Yeah. How many of them were delivered naturally? All of them. All of them. We only had one. No, we did have one um, uh, ewe prolapse, and it was a control. And she had a 23-pound ewe lamb. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that she had to exclude her from all of our analyses just because she was so big. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I also included this um, table. This is from Funston et al. And what it basically shows is this is across several different studies um, that were done. Um, and they looked at beef cattle. And so they were trying to see how supplementation of these cattle on range could, if it would have a positive effect on the calves um, postnatally. And as you can see, when you look through, I mean, this is in kilograms. So one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. Um, so even at the weaning weight, um, you can see that when you supplement with additional protein, um, there's major differences in those weaning weights of those animals, um, as well as some tendencies for um, the average daily gain to be better when you supplement, um, as well as, uh, you know, the marbling score to be improved when you supplement. So really just driving home that point again that how these animals are fed, depending on what situation that they're in, um, really does impact the productivity of those offspring um, later in life. And so this is some read that, uh, work that Dr. Reed did 
And so remember how I said the overfeds were weighing more? Um, well, when we look at their muscle fibers at birth, um, they tend to be uh, larger when we compare to control in both the overfed and the restricted. Um, however, when we look at the group at three months, when we took the muscle tissue samples, the muscle fiber diameter was smaller. So what this is telling us is, while we're not getting more muscle fibers, because again, that's fixed at birth, the ability of them to grow and increase in size is affected. So their muscle tissue isn't growing as well as those individuals that were fed that control diet. Um, so overall, again, it's just really impacting um, the muscle tissue growth with fat development. Um, I had to splash this up because again, pancreas, like coolest thing ever. Um, there's been work and we've done work with this too, um, with IV glucose challenge or tolerance test that basically shows that these animals don't respond um, to insulin as well. So they are actually more prone to being insulin resistant. Um, so what you can see here is they administer the glucose to these animals. Um, and in those nutrient respect restricted animals, they're still maintaining a high level of glucose, which should not be the case. Insulin should be bringing it down, helping it keep in check. Um, and that's because these animals are not releasing insulin as well in response to um, that uh, glucose bolus that's being administered. So basically, they're not producing as well. Yes? So this, was, this is restricted. So this is a group where... They did. This is Ford et al. They took sheep and they nutrient restricted them um, throughout gestation at 50% of the NRC requirement because um, they, or if it was, no, it was 40% because they were trying to mimic what they would see out on the rangeland. And what they found is it really affected their ability to, <coughs> it basically affected likely their pancreas development um, because they weren't able to, or the release of insulin or the cells themselves. Um, because they weren't able to, this is going to affect their ability to utilize nutrients efficiently and potentially can lead to health problems within these animals as well. So it's not only muscle and adipose tissue, but it's also their overall health. Um, and with some of the work that I've done, um, because I look at the pancreas tissue, I look at islets, which are basically what house the beta cells. And um, this, we actually find that the islet size, they're actually larger, but the number of islets is smaller, or less, which makes sense because if they're bigger, they're taking up more space, but the cell number is the same. So these, what's happening is the cells are responding to that maternal cues and that maternal environment, and they're actually getting bigger. Um, we don't necessarily understand 100% why that's occurring, um, when the mechanisms involved, <clears throat> and that's kind of what I'm writing to you know, NIH to get money for. Um, is to try to figure out why this is happening and the potential mechanisms. Um, so the research center summary overall, poor maternal, poor maternal nutrition during gestation negatively affects the metabolism growth and health of the offspring. So kind of our next goal as animal scientists is we're trying to figure out why this is happening, what some of the molecular mechanisms are, um, so that we can actually develop intervention strategies, whether it be for the dam or the offspring. Um, during the period in which you would be rearing them uh, prior to going to market. Because we understand, like, there's certain times of year, like, depending on the uh, production system, that you may not be able to supplement your animals. You know, if they're out way back in, you know, the back 100-acre lot out in Montana, they may not be able to supplement those animals. So trying to regain some of those productivity uh, of those individuals. Um, and right now, it's really trying to encourage, you know, producers to focus on the prevention aspects of it. Um, so the goal is to work with the producers to evaluate their nutritional management um, of animals during breeding and pregnancy. Um, Ariel Halperin, she should be defending her master's, I believe, soon at UConn. She actually conducted a survey of sheep producers in the Northeast to kind of get an idea of how they feed their animals, um, what type of the feeds they're feeding um, and what guidelines they're using. She should be publishing those data um, soon, and I believe they're going to be releasing an extension. Did Joe leave? 
dang it, because <laughs> I could have asked, he's, he's been, uh, he's on our committee. Um, so that's something else to like look out for because they should be putting those data out soon. Um, and those have been tabulated. So one of the things I always recommend to people, especially with cheap, so this is something with dairy, they test their feeds all the time. Um, you know, even beef as well, um, they will do it more often than not. Uh, don't see it so much with the small ruminant producers, but feed testing is like such a useful tool. Um, you can sample your hay, your forages, you can sample your grain um, and send it out, you know, take pooled samples and send it out because that's what will help you assess what your, what your point of nutrition is that your animals are on. And it actually can save you money. That's the other nice thing. If you actually could be overfeeding your animals and you don't even know it. Um, so we actually, uh, there was another study that we were working on. Um, Dr. Gately was looking at um, ketosis incidents in a couple of flocks. She was doing, I think she did three different flocks. And um, she used her own flock as kind of like a pilot. And she said she ended up saving so much money that season just by testing her feed and doing, um, going by the NRC requirements, she was saving like thousands of dollars because she was overfeeding them and she didn't even know it. Um, so testing your feed is great. Um, also working with extension providers um, to understand the analyses and what it is because what you end up getting back from Dairy One is this printout and it can be a little bit daunting <laughs> at first if you have never seen one before. So I've had, um, you know, I've spoken at workshops and I've even had people be like, okay, we did our testing. Now what? What does this mean? What am I looking at? So, and that's, it's okay. If you want to get tested and, you know, you want to reach out, reach out, you know, because we can help you go through it and figure out your hay is looking pretty good with protein, but, you know, available energy, not so much, you know, and um, working with uh, nutritionists to also try to tailor everything so that your animals are getting exactly what they need, but you're also not paying extra money um, that you may not need to. Uh, the other thing is utilizing feeding requirements. NRC requirements, National Research Council, they come up with this for, you know, exotic animals like elephants that are kept in zoos all the way down to mice that are used in research facilities. So they're always coming out with new guidelines. Um, which that kind of frightened us a little bit because we were in the middle of a study and they changed them and they released them and we were like, oh no, <laughs> we just formulated everything to the old ones. Um, so they have a tables online, many different extension websites will have them online, you can access them. Um, <clears throat> and it's a great way um, to utilize it within combination with the forage and feed testing, as well as um, understanding how to incorporate different feeds into the ration. There's a lot of interest for <clears throat> producers to use um, some less expensive commodities like brewer's grain, if they can get their hands on it. Um, and we actually had one producer come up to us and they're like, we've been feeding a lot of it. The sheep love it. It's like candy. Um, but we noticed our lambs this year, we had to pull a lot of them out. Like they were really, really big. And I was like, do you get it tested? And they were like, no, we just kind of, you know, guesstimate by what we feed them and we just kind of let them have it. So basically what's happening is they were overfeeding their animals and their lambs were getting super large because what happens is um, uh, if the, the fetus is perceiving um, more feed stuff, they will produce more insulin, to obviously, to take that up. But insulin also regulates growth in the fetus. So that's why if you overfeed, you can get those really big lambs. Um, so again, it's just figuring out how to utilize certain feeds and how to feed them um, and finding the balance there. Um, and I always flash this up when I give a talk too, just so that, um, you know, especially if the slides are saved um, or provided, um, and I try to provide it too. These are some of the requirements for um, a ewe during different stages of her pre-pregnancy as well as pregnancy. And you can see that it does change um, over time, especially the last four weeks of gestation, because that's when that fetus is going to increase the most in size. So that's when her demands are more. This is also when you're typically going to start to see ketosis. And the U, if she is not, uh, her nutrient needs are not being met, or usually you can see it with um, very obese ewes, um, they're more prone to ketosis as well. And that's usually because their ability to partition nutrients and 
uh, towards the fetus and such is just completely out of whack and they have uh, more predisposed to metabolic issues. So using this is um, great. And the other thing that's cool too is if you do ultrasound and because the ultrasound um, techniques are getting much better, it used to be, I don't know if you guys remember with the alocas, like people would carry around this like big clunky thing to ultrasound or they have the goggles. Um, now they literally have one that is on your wrist that some people are using. And it's like a little, little bit bigger than iPhone or they have one that's like an iPad and it's just super clear imaging and it's advanced a lot. So there's interest in trying to um, tailor your feeding towards um, how many lambs that you're expecting or how many fetuses you're expecting. Um, I do believe when I was at UConn, they were ultrasounding one cow and they found out she had triplets. So that was like a uh -oh <laughs> moment. Um, fortunately, I think she did reabsorb one. Um, the other thing is I always like to talk about is overfeeding is just as bad as underfeeding. Um, again, see it a lot more in the Northeast because we do have smaller flocks, more concentrates. Um, food is love. That's you know, kind of a thought. So sometimes, you know, oh, they're buying, I should give them more. You know, and so sometimes you have used that they look like this and she's like a body constriction score like five. Um, and you're gonna have maternal programming because of that too. As I mentioned with some of the data, um, there's gonna be increased nutrient supply. So that fetus is gonna be perceiving that and going, okay, there's gonna be plenty of food out there. Like. I got it in, but we have so much extra, let's store it away. And so that's where they actually are being programmed to have more adipose tissue. Um, it has to go somewhere. So sometimes that sacrifice at the expense of muscle. Um, so, and they're usually more pros, predisposed to metabolic issues as well later in life. Um, and then the other thing is poor you is probably so predisposed to metabolic issues. Like, I mean, if you have a you that looks like that, she's probably at pretty high risk for ketosis. Um, usually, and I can remember when I would show sheep, or I still show sheep, but like when I was learning how to do this and how much to feed, um, I had some ewes that were overweight. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, those were always the ones that would get ketosis. And that affects your bottom line because usually you're at risk for losing the lambs. Um, and they, usually the lambs don't grow as well after that. Um, I meant to bring a picture in of my daughter's favorite lamb who was born April 24th. And he maybe weighs 20 pounds right now because his mother had a myriad of issues during her pregnancy, total maternal programming um, because of uh, just, she was older and a hot mess. And he is just, tiny, 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 and he's a great example of maternal programming. I'm sure as you guys are sitting there as producers, you can probably think back in your memory, you've had some of those that they just don't grow well. So that's what the goal is to um, ultimately try to prevent that from happening. So one of the things we're trying to do as researchers is develop those intervention strategies. It takes time, it takes research to develop them. Um, the other thing that's really cool is Dr. Dew out in Washington State He's trying to figure out how to manipulate maternal nutrition for the better. So if we can modulate certain aspects in the diet, how can we make that like optimal growing animal and how can we make um, better meat and higher quality meat products that the consumer would want? So it's not necessarily looking at it from a deficient perspective or inappropriate perspective, but like fine tuning it. So using it to our advantage. Um, and so really right now, the focus is getting um, producers to really focus on the prevention, increasing the usage of forage testing, um, understanding the feed requirements, and also body condition scoring their flocks, because that's a super useful tool, because you can figure out and even separate out certain animals that may need more feed or less feed, depending on the situation. So um, more than happy to take any questions. I know I kind of threw a lot at you guys with like data, but you know, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them at this time. Interesting, are you in under or overfed for the entire duration? Um, we probably do something with you kids that are under for most of the pregnancy, except for six weeks, or three to eight weeks, go on to a very high end diet. Mm -hmm. um, so 
general game, the first cut heading for the early pregnancy, we have a new one for all this stuff, and then the last six weeks of the early high quality spring. And then this late year, it's been three weeks before pregnancy, it makes them a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. test your feeds? Okay. No, I mean, that can help you too because you actually might be feeding, you know, closer to the NRC or what they're supposed to be getting than yeah, you may we're think. We're the other thing too is there is some sort of, there is adaptation that occurs genetically within flocks. So if you've maintained virtually no grain and those animals for however long, you know, you've been doing that management system, you're eventually going to be selecting for those animals that, yeah, exactly. So, like, that does help kind of counteract, like, so, like, if you took that chubby you and put her, like, in that production setting, just boop, right off the bat, she would have a lot of trouble. And they would have maternal, you'd have big time maternal programming effects. But what you see usually is that if those animals have, been adapted over generations to that type of diet, they actually do better. So yours, in a way, have been probably maternal programmed, but in like a positive way because they, well, they've been selected for it. So, and that's one of the things we found out west is from the youths that were from out west, some of them, when we nutrient restricted them, they just kept going, kept gaining. They were doing okay because they were adapted to that from multiple generations. They've been programmed like for that. Um, when we overfed them, they blew up like ticks because they'd never been overfed like that before in their life. So, you know, whereas when we use the Yukon flock, when you nutrient restrict them, they just they plummet, you know, and we'd had to watch them really closely for their body condition scores and weight gains because of it. So there, hmm? The brown face ones that seem to be really good moms that go after other lambs. Yeah. Yeah. Which it kind of could be in a way, in its own way, you know, from the lactation standpoint, you know, that, that also can mess them up too. Um, yes. So, how would that, how would you work in the maternal program nutrition thing if you were doing a star system or in a sort of a modified star system because it's, I mean, when we're, I think we're trying to select for high milking ewes, mm -hmm. we'll probably, you know, in two months we're going to lean those lambs and they lose a lot of body condition. And, um, but then we're trying to breed back a bunch of them so that we've got some lambs in September, the bulk of them in February, and then some lambs in April. Mm -hmm. We've had some do you know, three in two years, but they are skin and mm -hmm. most of the time. And I, I mean, actually, I haven't saved those lambs out of them because they haven't been able to go yeah. very well. But on the other hand, they're awfully darn fertile. Yeah, <laughs> they are. I mean, some of it could be is that's where, you know, maybe, you know, consulting, especially with like a nutritionist and trying to tailor um, a program that is a little more, they would probably need a much more nutritionally intensive program than your average you that's only lambing once a year um, because they're going to need to get that, you know, meat back on their backs so that they can um, produce good lambs for you as well as be able to lactate because usually, again, that nutrient restriction or having, you know, in a nutrient depleted state is going to affect their lactation ability as well. So it, they're probably going to need something much more nutritionally intensive, I would think. Um, but genetically, in terms of what the lambs are going to look like, um, are we, I 
me, should we be saving those lands? In terms of, I, so if they end up with a higher fat mm -hmm. or these altered um, carcass characteristics, yeah, and uh, internal organ deficiency, are they going to? How much of that do they pass on to their offspring? I mean, it it's is environmental, but on the other hand, it could alter their genetics. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, what they've been finding from the multi generational studies that they've done is um, E it goes out as far as F F3, so the third generation. They'll still be having effects, uh, issues with body weight, um, getting too heavy later in life. Um, you know, with the pancreas studies, they're finding that their beta cell number, even though they're not perceiving that insult, the F2s and F3s are still having issues with insulin production and beta cell number. Um, fecundity can be affected um, by it. So, I mean, in that incidence, it would be definitely doing, you know, a more nutritionally intensive program, um, but also, like, if you want to retain some, pick the biggest and the best that you would have um, because... Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. So that's where, you know, it, it's trying to find the balance. Um, you know, and more information would definitely be needed on that type of U because the data that we get from a U that's just lambing once a year is going to be different than that that's managed on a star system. So that's something definitely to consider. Are you following the um, I probably have been too busy doing this. <laughs> 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 but we do try and body score them periodically and pull the ones that are getting thin towards the end of their pregnancy. Or like right now I have a bunch that are getting torn because they they haven't gained weight back as well as the others and I want them all even by the time September. So I mean we're trying to not have too many different groups, but if I had one more shed <laughs> it would be nice to be able to have four of those at all. Um, I'll stick a few on that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. A couple of times you talked about you might want to consult a nutritionist. Yes. What are the resources for the farmers out there in terms of finding a nutritionist who understands all of this who can give this kind of advice? Um, it, it really it depends. I mean, and I don't. It's sometimes with some of the people that I've talked with, um, you know, at different workshops and stuff, they already have someone that they're working with, whether it be a fee company, and it's just a matter of them maybe discussing things a little bit more. Um, you know, I always talk to people about reaching out to extension staff and helping them really try and find um, the right fit for their production operation, their animals. Um, just based on that, I know at URI we don't have an animal extension person, so we get a lot of outreach um, to the different faculty members, and so we kind of have to wear that hat. Um, so I try to help them out as much as I possibly can uh, with my knowledge base and talk to people that have bounced ideas off for show before too. Um, so just trying to put people in contact. I'm trying to be new. I'm trying to curate resources for the producers as well. So if anyone is interested or knows someone, let me know, um, and I would appreciate it.